forget to start recording. Okay, so again, I'm going to welcome everyone to the uh, Vermont Statewide Property Parcel Mapping Project and Program webinar. And we will start off with uh, why this project is happening. And uh, the basic idea here is that the current state of parcel data in Vermont as most of you probably know, is that it varies a lot from town to town uh, because uh, tax taxation, property taxation and property mapping and everything are left to the town to manage. That means it's going to vary a lot from town to town because towns make different decisions about what uh, resources they want to support their property taxation program and um, and also because towns differ in terms of the rate of change that happens within towns. So uh, the main goal of this program, this project and ongoing program, are to create consistent, up-to-date data. And you can see here that the first circle indicates one of the reasons we want the data to be consistent. And that is that it makes the data more useful. Both at the town level, which is a little bit more uh, conceptual, I think, a little bit harder to convince towns of, um, but it will potentially, it can make it more useful to the town and also more useful to state entities and regional entities like regional planning commissions, both of whom are interested in using parcel data across towns, not just within one town, but across a region, across the whole state, across a number of towns. And having the data be consistent from one town to the next is an important aspect of making uh, certain activities that you can do with parcels possible or just making the process of getting to the point of using them a uh, relatively efficient process rather than incredibly time consuming, which is how it is now. So um, I'll talk a little bit later about what I mean by consistent, but we are talking about the, the format of the digital data, what form it actually comes in, as well as the content of that digital data. One of the main uh, aspects of the, the consistency or following the standard that has been determined is to include the SPAN number, the state tax ID number in that parcel data. And what that does is it allows us to join uh, the parcel boundary information to the grand list information, which means that we have the ability to identify owners, to include assessment information either on the map uh, as a label or in the symbology of the map. You know, you can color parcels differently based on their uh, assessed value per acre. You can also uh, uh, do your map differently based on type of property, whether it's commercial or residential. There's all sorts of information that's in that grand list that can be really useful on a map. Uh, so one of the goals of the project or requirement actually of the project is a 99% match rate between spans that are found uh, land, with landed properties in the grand list and spans in the parcel data. So we want to make sure that everything that's showing up in the grand list is having land associated with it actually is showing up as a parcel of land on the map, on the parcel map or in the parcel map data. The second uh, aspect of what we're looking for with improving parcel mapping data in the state is that it be up to date. It varies a lot right now from town to town in terms of whether the data is updated on an annual basis, uh, whether it's updated every couple of years, or whether it's ever been updated. There are a few towns that actually got digital data back in the early 90s and have not updated since then. And then there are a lot of towns that fall in between. They either don't know whether they have digital data or not. In many cases, they do. They just don't use it themselves in the town office. Um, and that digital data may or may not have been updated over the years as the map itself got updated. Um, and, uh, and then in some cases, there are towns that either actually don't have any tax map or property uh, parcel map or that simply don't have that connection between the digital data and the paper map and therefore it hasn't been updated um, in a long time. So again, one of the goals is to have up-to-date data for every town in the state. And in some cases that is a simple update and annual update, in some cases that's going to be creating data from scratch, which is within the scope of this project for some towns, for the towns that need it. And then the final thing uh, that is a goal of this project is that the data be convenient. So uh, most of the towns in the state 
do have some digital parcel data. And for most of those towns, we do have a copy of that data here at VCGI, which means that it's available. We have an online mapping data portal that gives access to that data so that people can download it. Um, there are also ways that they can connect to it that involve streaming over the internet. It also means that that data is provided to the state online mapping applications such as a &R Atlas and the 911 viewer. Um, so by achieving the goal of improving the uh, comprehensiveness of that data, that is to say making sure every town has digital data, making sure every town's digital mapping data, uh, parcel mapping data is up to date, we're ensuring that every town is represented on those state map viewers like the Atlas and the 911 viewer. We're making sure that people who come to our portal, our data portal looking for that parcel data for any particular town are going to find it for every town. So we're um, making that data more convenient both to um, the citizens of the town because they can access the information through the Atlas and the 911 viewer and also to uh, state entities uh, regional entities and private sector folks who are potentially serving the citizens of your town. Uh, and that would include foresters, surveyors, environmental uh, consultants. So here's a little bit of description about the project itself. So this is a funded project that is being run by VTRANS, the Agency of Transportation. The funding for the project actually comes from the Federal Highway Administration. And um, one of the key things I want everyone to know about this project is that every municipality in the state is eligible and indeed is actually expected to participate in the project at some point over the three years. Right now we're in the first year of the project, so there are two more years or phases really uh, when a town can participate if they have not participated yet. So it's a really, really important thing I want to get across is that all municipalities are eligible. I'm going to see if I can turn on my little highlighter here and highlight that on my screen. All oops, sort of crossed it out. Um, and so, so we hope that every town is enthusiastic about participating as well. Um, I'm going to skip over benefits for just a second. Uh, I mentioned funding, but I also want to talk about how that funding is being handled. So um, the money that is not the, the sorry the project is not a grant program nor is it a reimbursement program to towns. Uh, this is a vendor-based program in the sense that the money is going to flow directly to mapping vendors or mapping contractors who do the work for the state but that the result of that work the, the data that is produced is also uh, a product for the town. It's public information, so and it will be provided to the town as well as to the state. Um, what that means is that there are 10 contractors, mapping contractors, who have been put under contract with the state for this project specifically, and uh, there's a process that's gone through to assign mapping contractors to towns where the contractors actually bid on the towns they want to work with, and um, and then the the VTrans team, which actually myself and another member of my organization are members of that team as well, review the, the proposals, the bids, and assign companies to towns based primarily on their suitability to work with that town, not based primarily on the bid. The bid is an important part of the submission, but it's not actually the first thing that we look at in assigning a company to a town. In fact, the very first thing we look at is whether that contractor has already already has a relationship with that town, already does maps for that town, whether the town wants to continue working with that contractor. And if those two things are true and the contractor has turned in a bid that's perfectly reasonable and indicates that they're, they can do the work, which they've already actually proven that by um, earlier processes, uh, then we are most likely going to assign that company to that town. Uh, for the towns that don't currently work with a particular mapping contractor or whose normal mapping contractor is not part of the 10 companies that have been hired or one of their subcontractors, and I'll show you that list in a little while. For those situations, um, a company will be assigned to the town. The town is not required to establish any additional um, 
uh, relationship with that company. They can choose to get additional products from them, uh, but they're not required to, and there's no match on the part of the town. So this project does not cost the town, explicitly cost the town anything in terms of um, having to come up with match. There, there is potentially a cost in terms of the time of listers or other town officials that would have to work with that mapping contractor. Um, and there may be um, tasks that that contractor is working on that, that request additional work from the listers or other town officials beyond what they might do in a normal year of map update. Um, so I'll talk about that in a moment too. Uh, the final thing I want to point out around that funding and that whole vendor state relationship is that the project funds are being used to create data, not paper maps. So if you think of the normal map update process for a town that gets annual or maybe every two years gets updates, that normal process will include a series of steps. Let's say there's four steps. The first step might be communicating with the town, collecting information about any uh, subdivisions or boundary changes that have happened over the past, whatever that period of time is, year or two. Uh, the second step would be taking that information and incorporating it into the digital data that is then going to be used to make the maps. But at that point, they're still working in the digital realm. Most parcel maps are created in on a computer in some kind of digital software. In some cases, it might be CAD. In some cases, it might be GIS software. Um, either way, there it's digital data. Those first two steps are activities that are covered by this project. If the contractors then moving on to making maps for the town, they move more into the realm of cartography, uh, thinking about other elements that are going to be on the map, working with that aspect of the map making process. And then the final step would be printing it out. Those two steps are not covered. Those activities are not covered by this project. Additional activities that are covered by the project would be taking the data that's now updated changing it and enhancing it so that it meets the state standard, that the parcel data standard that is required as part of this project. And then a final step is doing the 99% match. So there could be additional activity involved. When they do that comparison between the grand list and the parcel data, they might find there's only a 90% match. And given that there's a 99% requirement, they would have to come back to the town, most likely work with the listers and say, I'm only getting a 90% match. Can you help figure out why that is or make any changes to the parcel data that would uh, result in a more accurate map and therefore a better connection to the parcel, the uh, grand list? So those are um, the questions related to, or sorry, the issues related to funding. Uh, how this works, where the relationship is. If uh, the town does want paper maps from that vendor or another vendor, they would, as usual, they would set up a separate contract for the specific products that they want, the paper maps. And that also covers um, online mapping applications, custom online mapping applications that you might get with your map contractor. Um, funds or costs associated with that are not covered by this project other than the update to the digital data that would feed into that system. So the benefits to the towns um, are hopefully in some cases fairly concrete and then in other cases might be a little bit more indirect or uh, depend a lot on the town. So for some towns, if the timing is right, then you are going to not have to pay your mapping contractor to do those first two steps of their normal update process because the state will be paying them to do those steps. And when I say you won't have to pay them, what I really mean is you will need to negotiate with your mapping contractor to say, how much are you gonna charge me for my update this year based on the fact that the state is paying you to do the actual update to the digital data and the town really should only be paying you to do all the work that comes after that to end up with a map. So um, I need to emphasize, because I think it's something that, that I didn't emphasize enough earlier in this project, that it really is up to the town to negotiate that savings with their mapping contractor. Um, the information that you have that you can bring to the contractor to say, this is why we should get a reduction, is I know that the state is paying you to do um, these tasks that you would normally do for us. And so we should only be paying for you for tasks beyond that that lead to the 
paper map or uh, online custom map that is our final product. So um, in that way, municipalities can benefit. I want to emphasize again, this is not a reimbursement from the state to the town, and there's no grant from the state to the town um, to ensure that financial benefit. We can't promise that you're going to get that financial benefit. It's about the relationship between you and your mapping contractor. Um, the other benefits are that you're going to have, um, you know, for towns that haven't updated their data for a while, they're, they're going to get the benefit of having uh, a much of that paid for. For towns that don't have any map or data, obviously they're, they're saving a lot of money because that can cost tens of thousands of dollars to create a parcel map from scratch or from a very old uh, map. So those benefits are a little clearer, more, more obvious for certain towns. And then the more indirect or conceptual benefit is to towns that um, are going to get better data, more useful data, and maybe are going to take a, uh, advantage of the opportunity to start learning about how they could be using that data. And um, obvious ways would be understanding what sorts of things they can ask the Regional Planning Commission to do with their parcel data, what kinds of maps they can develop. Uh, and then the town itself may want to develop more internal capacity around using uh, the digital data. There are a variety of ways that a town can access their parcel data plus many other mapping layers that are free um, from online mapping to desktop mapping that is free and open source software. BCGI and your regional planning commissions can help you learn more about those options. Oh, I've stayed on this page too much. Now it doesn't want to move forward. <laughs> there we go. So, oh, I have to erase that somehow. So, um, so I've been talking about the project. The project is a limited time funded effort. Uh, we are right now in the first year, or the first phase of that project where the first 73 towns are actually being worked on right now. Uh, the second two phases will be the remaining towns in the state. Our hope is that the second phase will be 90 towns, and then the third phase will be the remaining 90 towns in the state that haven't participated yet. So each town will participate for one year, um, and then we'll be done with this probably by the end of 2019, maybe the very beginning of 2020. We do have a program that we have set up. So a program is an ongoing thing. Um, there is no funding from the program to towns. There's a little bit of funding that's coming from all the state agencies that, that comes to VCGI to help support us have to have the staff to call it a program. <laughs> uh, technically, I think we have one and a half, maybe, uh, staff. Myself, part of my time, and then my colleague, Jenny, uh, all of her time is supposed to be devoted to the program. What the program can provide and there's some overlap here with the regional planning commissions. We, as we do now, we plan to coordinate and, and partner with the RPCs to support the town. So it's really up to the town who they get support from uh, to some extent, but the program is dedicated to providing the support. So we can provide a certain amount of technical support. And by technical support, I mean uh, information about how to use the data, how to ensure that you have updates into the future, um, the sort of technical slash administrative support in a way because we can provide um, uh, process, information about the process necessary to hire a mapping contractor. So if your town gets assigned a mapping contractor during this project, doesn't have a previous relationship or doesn't want to work with your previous mapping contractor, doesn't want to work with the one that gets assigned to you beyond that one year, that's fine. Um, we can actually help you uh, understand and go through the process to hire someone because we really, really recommend that every town, when they're looking at changing or hiring a new mapping contractor, that they go through a competitive process with a request for proposals. It's not as scary as it sounds. We can provide template documents. We can walk you through um, writing an RFP, walk you through the process of how you get that RFP out, how you take in re proposals and uh, review them, and how you make decisions. It, the decisions are uh, up to the town. Um, you make the decisions, but we can walk you through how you do it. Uh, regional planning commissions can also provide that type of support. We can also provide the support about how to use the data, what sorts of options are out there to, um, to do mapping or to access mapping information within your town. 
there are a lot of options and it completely depends on the town um, what level of option you might want to consider. And again, the RPC can support uh, some of that as well. Uh, number two on here is that VCGI is going to continue to do what it does now, which is pull the data together from all the towns and make it available to the public. And that includes, as I mentioned before, making it available at our data portal for download, available via web services, which is how people with mapping software can access the data uh, streamed over the internet, and then also making sure that it gets added to mapping applications like the ANR Atlas and the 911 viewer. Um, Another aspect of that is that we are working on improving the process we have now. Some of you who, whose data already gets uh, sent to VCGI and it already gets posted in the mapping applications may have noticed there's a bit of a time lag <laughs> between when your data gets updated and when it actually appears in our applications. And that is something that we are working on. We, we have a plan for how to do it differently so that it's much quicker. And um, and part of this project, and, and kind of as it leaks over into the program or, or transitions into the program, is that we want every town to include in their contract with their mapping contractor as they um, set that up for just doing ongoing updates, that they include in that contract a, a statement that in addition to the contractor providing maps or data to the town, they're always going to include a copy of the updated data and send it to VCGI. And that helps to ensure that the town doesn't have to remember, the RPC doesn't have to remember, VCGI doesn't have to remember to get the data. It just flows naturally to VCGI when it gets updated. And then we quickly incorporate it into our portal and all of the, the mapping applications. Number three on here uh, is about the fact that we do want to offer to a limited number of smaller towns with limited capacity um, the option that VCGI might be able to edit your digital mapping data. And what this means is for towns that don't have a lot of change each year and are unlikely to want to do annual or even every two year updates, um, that if there are a small enough number of updates, to do each year that we might actually be able to take that on and work with your town directly to get the information about subdivisions and uh, boundary changes. And uh, so that's something that we have, we are going to offer. We have not come up with any criteria or thresholds for how exactly that will work. It might be a bit of a case by case basis. So if your town thinks you might be interested in that in the future, uh, keep that in mind and let us know at some point uh, if you'd like to talk about that. Uh, and then, as I said before, unfortunately, right now, there's no identified funding for the program to provide to municipalities. It's something that we could potentially advocate for in the future if it seems like it's necessary in order to ensure that uh, all the towns are doing regular updates, because that is a really high goal or high priority of all the state agencies. Um, all the agencies are interested in parcel data and all of them want to see the data updated on a regular basis, and which is why this project and program are happening. Okay. Sorry, when I sit on a, there we go. Um, so the timeline for the project, where we are right now is obviously, actually we're December, so we're just past November, but the, the, um, Companies got assigned to towns for this first phase, so the first 73 towns. Uh, that did happen in November. It was towards the end of November, but uh, all of the companies got their uh, task order signed, which is the moment at which they are really authorized to start work and had their kickoff meetings before Thanksgiving. So work has started on those towns. There's about a six-month time period between when that work starts and when their first draft final data is due, and that will be in May. I think it's within the first couple of weeks of May. And so at that time, the expectation is they've completed the creation of the data or the update of the data. They're going to submit it. They, it, they should have run it through a quality control process that, that the goal of which is to ensure that it meets the standard, the parcel data standard, which is a published document. And uh, so when they submit it, it really should be done. But because we're all technical people and we know that it's challenging to get data perfect, we do have a built-in six-week time period right here uh, between when the draft data 
submission is required and when the final data submission is required. So everybody has to submit in May. Uh, we run the data through the same quality control process that they have access to. And if we find any issues, we just hand it back to them and say, nope, here are your issues, need to fix these uh, by June something. I don't know exactly the, what the date is. Um, but sometime in June, there's a hard date by which they have to do that final, final data. Once we have that data, we will use our enhanced process to get that data um, available to everyone quickly. And as that final part of the project is happening between May and June, we hope that we will be actually starting the process for the next phase or the next year of the project. And that will involve publishing a final list of towns that are participating in that second phase providing that to the contractors and having the contractors then have a time period within which they can develop their uh, task order proposals for that second pile of towns. They will submit those sometime during the summer. There will be a deadline. And um, the hope is that those year two assignments will be made sometime in July and that work would begin either late July or early August on that second um, group of 90 towns. One thing to keep in mind about that time frame is that, and actually about how the project work is, works, is that the project cannot pay for work that has already happened. And what that means is, if it's possible for you as a town that wants to participate in phase two, if it's possible for you to delay uh, the work that your mapping company would normally do for you until that assignment has been made here in July, if you can wait, if you're if you and your company can agree that they're going to wait until that point to start, then the works that they do that is um, within the scope of work of the project will be paid for by the project. And that is what helps to ensure that you, the town, are going to see some savings, assuming once again you've negotiated that with your mapping contractor and it's in your contract with them. Um, so that's just something important to keep in mind about the time frame of this whole project. The third phase, if we think about that six months plus six weeks time frame from say it starts in August, uh, that is, so that would be five, six months would be the end of January, say, um, end of January, beginning of February as the draft data deadline for the next phase, which would mean then six weeks after that would be the final data deadline. So it'd be earlier than it was this past year. It'd be more like uh, late winter, say. And then that third phase would start around that time. So just if you're thinking about when these, the timing of these phases, um, that is how we anticipate that's going to go. Uh, so this this slide is just to show kind of all of the the players, the the um, participants in this project, and what their roles are. You can see that other state agencies and BTRANS bring funding to the project, primarily through BTRANS, it's federal highway funds, but there's a little bit being contributed by each of the other state agencies, and they're going to continue uh, submitting a little bit of funding to support the program. BTRANS also is the organization that's hired the project management uh, company that is helping us manage the project. Mapping contractors bring their expertise and capacity to do the work. When we look at the list of town, uh, list of companies working on this, you'll see that some of them are companies that have been working in Vermont for years, and some of them are companies that are actually new to Vermont. And we really had to do that um, because the existing companies already working in Vermont would not have had the capacity to do uh, the work that we require of them as quickly as we're requiring it uh, to finish within three years. The towns obviously bring their expertise and knowledge around the land records, the boundary and ownership information, uh, hopefully funding for your future map updates since we don't have additional funding for that. Um, although once, I will say that once the data has been updated and improved up until like, you know, being uh, perfect and up to date this year, the cost of updates are, um, is not a huge amount per year, per every two years. If your town hasn't done this, um, that's something to consider. It's going to vary a lot from town to town and vendor to vendor, but um, it's not a huge amount of money. And then, uh, and obviously, the participation of the towns is an essential part of this project. Um, 
The RPCs provide uh, technical and outreach support to the towns. They can answer questions. They can help you understand how the mapping process works, how you would hire a vendor. And also, they can help you understand how you can use your data. Uh, they can use your data, so you can ask them to make maps and do analysis for you that takes advantage of your parcel data. And then uh, my organization, BCGI, is providing the staff to develop the program, to support the project. We are part of the team that meets every week to um, talk about what's going on with the project, to answer some of the technical issues around data development and the characteristics of the data, all that stuff. And then we are the ones who are going to make the data available via our open geodata portal and web services. The final result of all of this is better access to standardized, consistent parcel data across the state through the portal, through web services, and through the online maps that various state agencies put out there. Uh, I wanted to show some examples of how, how having really good, consistent digital parcel uh, data is useful. So these are a couple of custom online uh, parcel systems that a couple of different companies have developed for their clients. So here's one that Groton is paying for. So I just want to be clear that this is something that is a product that Groton is paying a mapping contractor for. Uh, it's not going to be automatically developed for every town that participates in this project. It's easier to do something like this or to develop something like this if you have the up-to-date standardized data. Um, and there are options that regional planning commissions can do for you that might be free or inexpensive. Um, so that's something to think about. But this particular example is a custom system developed by a vendor for Groton. So if I zoom in on the map a bit, we start to see the parcel boundaries. If I click on the map, you can see that my cursor is an eye. If I click on the map, I'm highlighting a property and I start, I get this pop-up that gives me, in this case, a picture, a link to the property card, which is going to be a pretty familiar looking format. And then uh, also, I can just look at a lot of that information right here in the application. So it pulls that grand list information and CAMA information into um, this pop-up. I can also do another function on here that some of the custom online applications that the vendors do uh, offer, not all of them, and that is to create an abutters list automatically. So you can see that I can set a uh, buffer distance, and then when I click on select, it's going to select all the properties that are, in this case, within 100 feet of that uh, highlighted property. And then I can uh, create an abutters report in PDF or Excel format or mailing labels in PDF or Excel format. I'll just click on that to show you. So a few clicks, and I've very easily uh, generated something that I can now just send to my printer and print some parcels. Here's another example by a different company for Montpelier. Same basic idea. We've got a digital interactive map. We can see the parcel boundaries on here. We can zoom in. Uh, this map is symbolized a little bit differently, and also Montpelier has building footprints, so that's on the map as well, which can be really helpful. Um, once again, I can make my cursor an identify tool, click on a property, over on the left, I'm going to get the information about the parcel ID, the name, address, some information about the lot, and the assessment information. I also have that link to the property card. Slightly different format, but I think the same basic idea in terms of what listers generally see on a property card. And um, Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to show on these. And then the final thing is, sort of as a contrast to those, actually, um, if you go to our the map center at the VCGI website and then interactive maps, we can get to the Agency of Natural Resources Atlas. So this is one of the most popular online state uh, applications. It takes a bit to load because it has a lot going on. 
It has a lot of functionality, a lot of data layers you can look at. By default, we see this little welcome page, but I can change that over to the layers panel, which um, shows me a whole bunch of data layers, map data layers, including parcels where available. Now, they don't show up right away because I'm zoomed out too far. So if I zoom in quite a bit, I will eventually see some data or see some parcel boundaries. So there's the parcel boundaries in red. Once again, I can click on the map and I get a pop up. Now, this is where we see the results of the fact that we have very inconsistent data in Vermont. Um, in order to put together a statewide parcel layer that could be used in this uh, statewide mapping system. We had to take all the different towns data, glue them together, and make some decisions about what type of information was attached to each parcel, or rather make some determinations about what we were seeing attached to each parcel. In some cases, we had no other information, like they're called attributes for each parcel. And in some cases, there are attributes there, but we had to figure out what they were because the name of that attribute might or might not be clear. So for instance, the parcel number, which would be the town um, map ID number or parcel ID number. In some cases, it was obvious. In some cases, uh, we we thought probably we knew which one it was, and we would actually say, okay, that's probably the parcel ID number, and in that case, you would see a value here. Uh, in some cases, we didn't know, or it wasn't there, so that's why we get a blank next to parcel number. Same thing with span number. In some cases, it was clearly labeled on in the data, and we could say, oh, that's the span number, and basically um, map it to this span attribute here, and that way it'll show up in this map. In many cases, uh, in most cases, we know the year of the data because it's actually in the name of the data layer, so that attribute is populated. And in some cases, the acreage is populated if, again, that was an obvious attribute in the um, in the, the original data that we were pasting together. So this is where you're going to see. Whoa, 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 sorry, this is where you're going to see a lot of variation. Um, in our statewide applications uh, is that in some cases you will see uh, information when you click on the map and in some you won't. And it's just going to vary a lot from town to town. I'm just going to see if I can show, see what Waterbury looks like real quick. Yeah, it's kind of similar. So. One that a town that I looked at yesterday I actually noticed that the parcel, the span number was obviously mapped incorrectly because the format was not a span number. So I'm not sure how that ended up being mapped that way. Um, but the point is that people here at VCGI have to make a determination with each uh, town's parcel data, and the fact that it varies so much makes it really hard to do that consistently and accurately. Whereas once we have data that's consistent and um, and has the same attributes uh, for every town, it becomes much easier to make that determination and make sure that the data that's published on the mapping applications is accurate. I'm going to go real quick now to the parcel program page at our website. So to get more information about the project, you can go to this web page at our uh, website. You'll see a link to me, link to the contractors, um, contact, and that's the, the project manager on the program. And then there's some overview information. There's a dynamic map here that you can use to figure out which of your neighboring towns are already participating in phase one and which company they're working with. That's what that's going to tell you. And then further down on that page, there are links to other information, including the parcel data standard that I've referred to a few times, and the list of mapping contractors. So the list of mapping contractors is just a document, and it lists their contact information. And it also lists their subcontractors. So if you want to check whether the company you already work with is on here, you just need to go check this list. And, it's, and if the company you work with is a subcontractor of one of the um, contracted companies, 
And uh, that will count in terms of making that company one that we are likely to assign to your town as long as you still want to work with that company. Okay, and then the standard. So the standard is a technical document. It describes various aspects of the format and content of the data. Some of the questions that I've gotten about this standard, I'm just sorry, I'm going to zoom down to the section that answers the most common question, which is, what is the content that's required of the um, data? So here we get into what the attribute requirements are for the various pieces of the data. This is the line version of the data. This is, did I go too far? No. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay. That's the inactive. Nope, I'm in the right place. Um, So um, over on the left here are the field names, or if you think of it as a table, these would be the column headings of the attribute data associated with the parcel data. So each of these fields would have a value of some kind in it for each parcel. Oh, this is for the inactive data, sorry. So the key attributes that you see in here are span number, map ID, which would be the town's ID number, property type, and this is a simple uh, um, indication of whether it's actually a parcel or whether it is water or whether it is a road, easement, uh, the year of the data, the name of the town, uh, and then we have a number of fields that although some of them do require uh, entry, I want to point out the fact that these are primarily uh, uh, placeholders for information about uh, editing and changing the data. So the source of the data and then the editing of the data. So it creates a place in the data where you can enter that information as updates are made into the future. These do not mean that you're going to have that your contractor is going to have to go back in time to figure out the original source for every single parcel. It means that uh, they'll fill something in uh, during their process, but then in the future, as things get updated, you will be able to uh, have that information about why it was updated. All right, so that's a quick one. I don't want to spend too much time on the standard just because that's really more of a technical document. Uh, all right, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Well, the other thing in my PowerPoint, I think, is my contact information page. These are my slides in case the internet's not working. So there's uh, my contact information, and one of the most important things to know is that if you would like to participate or if you have any questions, all you have to do is send me an email. Uh, that's, that's how you uh, indicate your interest in participating. So. I'm going to open it up for questions now. I've got a couple here waiting for me, and I want to encourage everyone else who has any questions to go ahead and type them in and send them. So one question is, are all the contractors established for the course of the program, or can others be added later? Right now, as far as I know, they are established for the program. Uh, I think that it would be possible for one of the existing contractors to take on a subcontractor. They probably would just have to do a contract amendment. Uh, so if there was a company that was interested in working uh, with one of the existing contractors, I believe that would be an option. But as of r right at this moment, there's no, there are no plans to open up the, um, the process again to find more contractors. Uh, second question is, have the towns for phase two been decided yet? No, I'm, this, I'm actually doing this webinar and, and a number of uh, parcel project informational meetings in an attempt to solicit participation. Right now, I have somewhere, I think, around 55 towns. And as I said, my goal is 90. And we're pretty much just doing it based on whoever's willing to step forward and volunteer to participate. Um, we're not using any criteria or anything to exclude or include any towns. We want everyone to participate. So um, 
So anybody that steps forward and sends me an email and says, yes, my town wants to participate, you get put in the phase two folder. And you can also say you want to participate in um, in uh, phase three if you want to. You can tell me that now if you'd like. That's fine as well. Um, let's see. Ah, someone asked, what percentage of towns do you expect to participate? 100%, <laughs> which I know is might seem like an unrealistic expectation um, to uh, some folks, but one thing to keep in mind is we want 100% voluntary participation. The reality is that even if a town says they don't want to participate, the information that we're talking about is public information. Um, if absolutely necessary, we will assign a contractor to work with a town by going into the, the town records and putting together parcel data or taking existing parcel data and updating it based on publicly available information. We have no interest in having that happen without the active participation of the town, but VTRANS wants to have 100% updated parcel data for the whole state. So um, it will happen one way or another. We really want it to be a, a beneficial partnership with the town. Um, how, any idea how much online map would cost? I assume you mean uh, a custom online map working with a vendor. I don't really know, and I shouldn't say I will. Um, some vague memories of numbers that I've heard towns talk about when they were considering it uh, are somewhere between, and I honestly don't know. I don't have a, a comprehensive knowledge, so please don't take this as the be-all, end-all. If you're interested in it, you should ask. Uh, probably multiple vendors to get a sense, but I have heard numbers between like a thousand and three thousand, some, somewhere in there. As um, and that would be an annual uh, uh, cost to to maintain that online system. So it is a you know it's a significant additional cost. Uh, a bunch of towns have done it and are choosing to do it, but it, it's an option. And remember that there are potentially slightly less functional, less customized, less um, fancy options that you could do with the Regional Planning Commission as well. Um, what you pay the contractor for provides a lot more functionality, and that's why a lot of towns are finding it worthwhile. But there are other options that are a little bit um, you know, free and a little bit less functionality. Uh, is this the same presentation I'm giving in person throughout the state? Yes. The only difference is that I'm not sitting in a room with town officials. I'm sitting in a in front of a computer and talking to all of you. So, but yes, other than that, it's exactly the same presentation. So those are all the questions I have right now. Hopefully, um, I've done an okay job of getting all of this across to you. I I will say that I know that this is. I think this whole project and the, the way it's working is a little bit harder to understand than I realized when I first started going out talking about it because there has been a fair amount of misunderstanding of how it's going to work. So I'm going to reemphasize some of the common uh, misunderstandings that I have found out there. Uh, one is that only towns that currently don't have maps or don't have digital data or are very out of date, that only those towns are eligible. That is not true. Every single town in the state is eligible. Even if you are a town that keeps your data perfectly up to date, every year you get an updated map or you have online custom system already set up, even if that is the situation, we want your town to participate because there is a very good chance that as perfect as your data is, it may not exactly meet the standard. And for the sake of consistency, we really want every town to be on board with having consistent data. Um, so any effort on the part of your regular mapping contractor that would be necessary to tweak your data to make it meet the standard, we want to pay for that. If uh, your mapping contractor has a particular way that they maintain the data because it works with the online system that they do for you, that's fine. We will also pay them to create a little software that will transform the data from their format or your format to the state standard format. So, um, and then that software can be reused over and over again. So each year, in order to turn it into the state and the state format, it would just be a, a sort of a turn the crank operation to achieve that. Um, uh, let's see, so that was one of the most common things is that not everyone's eligible, everyone's eligible. Um, 
I can't promise and the state can't promise how much savings you will you will get if again if you normally do updates every year every couple of years we believe that it's reasonable to expect that you would get uh, a discount on your normal rate that you pay because the state is going to be paying for activities that that contractor would normally perform it may depend on the timing of how you participate when you participate it may depend on simply how you negotiate with your contractor around that um, we are happy to provide any information necessary so that you feel confident in negotiating with your contractor. Um, but that's pretty much as much as we can do. We can explain what the tasks are that the state is paying for, and we can um, we can actually, once, once everything is set up and you have a company assigned to your town, we can tell you how much we're paying that company to do those tasks, to do those portions of the activity. Um, one of the other misconceptions is the idea that it's a reimbursement or grant program. It's not. There's no money flowing from this project or program to towns at this time. The project, the money flows from VTRANS to the mapping contractor directly to achieve the tasks and the final products and deliverables that are required by the project. Um, I think those are the main things that I have found that I that I feel that I haven't been getting across to everyone. So I just want to reiterate those. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, and I am just babbling on at this point. So I think that I will probably stop, and I will remind everyone that this uh, webinar is being recorded, and when I shut it all down, it will convert into a format that I can upload to our VCGI YouTube channel which you can get to by going to the front page of our website. And on the left, all the way down on the left, under Connect With Us, you will see that link to our YouTube channel. And that's how you, um, and you'll see it'll get listed right at the top here once I upload it, or you can switch over to videos where you only see the videos that we've uploaded. And um, it will appear right here over to the left of Census Bureau webinar once I do it. And I should be able to do that by this afternoon uh, because it'll do its processing during lunchtime and then I'll do that right after lunch. So I think that's all I have. If nobody has any more questions right now, then I'm going to shut down the webinar. I'm going to pop up my contact info one more time just in case um, you'd like to jot that down or do a screenshot. If you have any questions about this, please send them to me. If you would like me to come speak in your town office to convince uh, anybody in your town office about the value of the program, how digital parcel data can be used, um, just to answer more questions because it might be easier in person, happy to do that. Oh, the one additional thing I'll show you now that I think about it is there are a few more live, um, sorry, i got to find out where I am, live, uh, presentations at regional uh, in concert with the regional planning commissions coming up so I'm just going to pull up our list of coming events and you will see um, parcel mapping information meeting northeastern Vermont that's going to be in St. Johnsbury on December 11th uh, Bennington County that's going to be I believe in Arlington December 13th and then a final one in St. Albans either town or city uh, on January 18th. So those are the three final live uh, info meetings that are coming up. And you can, again, go to our website, click on events, click on click here for a list of all events, and then click on the title of the one that you're interested in for more details. And that'll tell you where it is and um, what time and all that. Okay. That is the final bit of information I'd like to leave you with. So thank you very much for participating and sticking with me for an hour. I hope this was helpful. And again, I encourage you to get in touch if you still have questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.